Good morning. My name is Christina Byrne, and I am the Department Manager of Public Outreach at OCTA. Thank you for joining us this morning for the Coastal Rail Resiliency Study listening session with Freight and Goods Movement, as well as our partners at the U.S. Marine Corps. Thank you so much for joining us. We're about to get started. Um, if you could, uh, please introduce yourself when we uh, start the meeting. Um, we'll call on you to go ahead and introduce yourself, and if you could provide your name and affiliation, that would be wonderful, as well as what you're hoping to um, get out of this session. We would love to hear from you to make sure we can tailor our presentation to your needs, your concerns, and your questions as we go through the presentation itself. Again, my name is Christina Byrne, and I'm the Department Manager of Public Outreach at OCTA. This session is the Coastal Rail Resiliency Study listening session with freight and goods movement, as well as our partners at the U.S. Marine Corps. This meeting is being recorded for documentation purposes, and we will be taking verbal comments as well as um, comments in the chat. So please feel free to utilize both. Written comments and questions can, again, be submitted through the chat. And if you are um, dialing in today via a phone and you would like to speak, use the raise hand button at the bottom of the Zoom screen. If you're calling in, press star nine to raise your hand and star six to unmute and mute. It's a little bit different if you're calling in from um, a phone, but we want to make sure that you're included as a part of this discussion. So please don't hesitate to participate. Again, my name is Christina Byrne, and I'm the Department Manager of Public Outreach at OCTA, and it's my pleasure to um, turn the introductions over to Dan Fu. Thank you, Christina. Good morning, everyone. I'm Dan Fu from the OCTA Planning Division. I am serving as the project manager for this effort, and it's a team effort definitely with Christina and others who are on this call this morning. So with that, I'll hand it off to Allison. Next slide, please. Oh, good morning, everyone. I'm Allison Army with OCTA Planning. Okay, uh, Jason. Hey, good morning, everybody. Um, Jason Lee, OCTA uh, Rail Programs. Alice. Alice Rogan, and I'm the Director of Marketing and Public Outreach. Thank you for your coming and, and for your time today. Thank you. Any, uh, oh, Melanie? Yeah, it's still Melanie Masood, uh, OCTA Government Relations. Hey, thank you so much. And uh, from our consultant team, George. Good morning, George Roska with HDR, supporting the study. Thank you. Any other OCTA staff? I don't see any other OCTA. Oh, I'm sorry, Eric Carpenter just came on. Yeah, hi, Dan. Uh, Eric Carpenter with the Public Information Office. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much. And um, those who are on the line, um, let's see. For those who are on the phone, can you please uh, introduce yourself? Let's start with Hugo. Hugo, it seems we can't hear you for some reason. Hmm. Let's go ahead and move on to other uh, folks on Matthew? the phone so we can come back to Hugo. How about Matthew? Good morning, Matthew Doman, San Diego and Imperial Valley Railroad. Thank you so much. And Hugo, if you could put your information in the chat, that would be great. Kristen Thomas. How about um, the la the phone number with the last four digits, 6445? Good morning. This is Sam Jamal, Marine Corps Base Camp Pendleton. Thank you for joining us. 
Um, and the next um, phone number, last four digits, 1789. Hi. Can you guys hear me? Yes, we can. This is, oh, hi, this is Kristen Thomas. I'm with Marine Corps Base Camp Pendleton. I'm the planning branch head here. Excellent. Thank you so much. I'm trying to scan here and see if we're missing anybody. Did we get everybody, Nancy? It looks like, yes, we did. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. All right, um, so let's pivot to the agenda. Um, as soon as we get through the agenda, Dan will be going through the history, history of the Coastal Rail Resiliency Study, um, going over the goals and objectives of the short and midterm study, as well as the potential reinforcement areas we'll be discussing today. We will review the study schedule and key milestones. I'll be reviewing the study outreach efforts as well as conducting the listening session um, towards the end of the presentation where we really want to hear from you. We want to hear from you regarding any of your questions or concerns regarding the study, um, any organizations we should be adding to the discussion, and then we'll going, be going through the next steps. So with that, I'll turn the agenda over to Dan. All right, thank you again, Christina. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so um, I know there are many folks on this call who are uh, relatively unfamiliar with this effort. So I'll take a moment and just kind of give some history and context. And at, at any moment, if you have any questions, please feel free to stop me. It's a small group. So I think we can have that um, interaction this morning. So in terms of local resiliency activities over the last several years, um, OCTA and our partner over at the Southern California Railroad Authority or Metrolink have undertaken several major projects due to emergencies that have, have occurred along the, um, the coastal rail down in South Orange County, uh, roughly between the San Diego Orange County line to about the northern uh, portions of Dana, uh, I'm sorry, um, of uh, San Clemente. So you're looking at several miles of that railroad where it's very close to the coastline and we've had some challenges with uh, bluff uh, failures as well as even beach erosions. So this is a, uh, I don't wanna go over every single one of these, but really the, the takeaway here is that we've had four, if you look at the top four um, line items, four projects that, that have, um, we have undertaken by way of emergency projects and they're along various stretches along uh, str uh, various stretches of the coastal rail in the San Clemente area. And the time span occurred between fall of 2021 through even early part of this year, and that's still ongoing. Uh, if you look at the fourth line item, where it says uh, milepost 204.2, um, we had a shutdown as a result of erosion back in January, and that, um, closure still exists while we're trying to re, uh, work with Metrolink to remediate the situation. So the last couple of items are um, activities that are undertaken by the city of San Clemente. We are working closely in terms of monitoring what they're doing. And eventually this larger effort is gonna try to integrate where pe uh, feasible and possible some of the efforts that have been done by others such as the city of San Clemente. Um, Next slide, please. So in terms of the four areas, uh, starting with the, uh, the, the Sutterly uh, incident back in 2021, we call it milepost 206.8. That's the location of the railroad down in Cypress Shore, which is uh, the south part of San Clemente. We had a situation where there was a ancient landslide. You can see the homes that are built on top of the bluff on the upper right-hand corner and left-hand corner. And there, there was a landslide that effectively pushed the railroad to um, towards the ocean, uh, and it it occurred. Um, it was pretty significant in terms of the movement. It um, pushed the railroad approximately twenty eight inches to the west, and so we had to work on stabilizing the um, the landmass that was coming in a westerly direction, and the solution was a tieback. And railroad operation uh, resumed back in April of 2023 of last year. Next slide, please. So this next situation happens, uh, a similar situation where there was a landslide from the city owned, in this particular case, 
That property that you see in the upper left-hand corner is called the Casa Romantica uh, Gardens and Cultural Center. And that particular property experienced a, 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 a landslide and the debris uh, had pushed onto the railroad and there was a closure. And as a result, we had to undertake another project to uh, provide a barrier wall, a temporary barrier wall to um, effectively capture all that debris that was coming down. The city is currently uh, working on a tieback solution, which is similar to what we had done in the previous um, mile post to 6.8 location. So in this particular situation, we were able to restore service in summer of 2023. Next slide, please. And most recently, this is at the Mariposa Beach Trail. So there's a portion that has a, a bridge and you can see in the upper left-hand corner, the landslide, um, this lodge, the a couple spans of the bridge and so Metrolink and OCTA had to work together to remove the two, uh, the two spans. Otherwise, it would have eventually come down into the, the track area and uh, potentially cause major damage to the, to the tracks. So that uh, situation is still ongoing where uh, we're working with the city and the private property owner to the very top to remediate this situation. And again, the solution is likely going to be a temporary, temporary barrier wall to hold the um, the debris that's coming down uh, coming down from the upper portion of the slope, so passenger service has been suspended as of late January, and it's still um, suspended. Although there's limited service that uh, has uh, resumed with Amtrak, and I believe uh, we're working with Metrolink on on a similar situation with a temporary service re uh, or um, limited service resumption. Uh, next slide, please. So in terms of why we're here today, as you can see, kind of the setup for this was we have had a lot of emergencies starting from fall of 2021 through even January of this year. And so something has to be done in terms of looking at a seven mile stretch of this railroad, which is really um, about 200 feet or closer to the beach um, that's on the westerly side. And then we have experienced slope failure uh, in many spot locations along the east side of the railroad, namely in, within the city of San Clemente. So we want to basically undertake or we're undertaking a what we call a short and midterm study. And part of this study, um, the key part of it really is stakeholder engagement, which is why you're all here today. And we wanted to get your feedback on and thoughts on um, solutions and things that we ought to uh, think about as we go uh, on a forward basis in looking at all, all of the possible uh, solutions. And really the key here is to protect the railroad in place. So there's a railroad there today. Um, there's been talks and some of you may have heard about potential coastal retreat or relocation to some sort of an inland alternative but that's going to be many, many decades out in terms of how realistic it is to actually move the railroad. But in the meantime, this is a nationally important as well as state and locally important, um, important railroad line. And so it needs to be kept up in, in service and uh, really we can't afford to have any more service interruptions. So with that in mind, we have undertaken this short and midterm study. The short term is really looking at solutions that would last us up to a better part of a decade. And then in terms of midterm, it's upper uh, lasting us uh, for several decades. And that's really what we hope to accomplish by the end of this endeavor. And by the way, we started this sometime during the latter part of 2023. It's a two year study that's uh, slated to be complete sometime in the end of 2025. Um, next slide, please. So again, as part of the, um, the short and midterm study, looking at 10 year solutions, um, more midterm solutions that are 30 years out, what we're recognizing uh, in looking at the last several years uh, is that there are just uh, emergencies that's happening literally once a year, twice a year that's caused and led to extended closures. And so this is really what we call an initial assessment is really looking at 
what are immediate things we need to do to keep the railroad operating while we're doing longer, slightly longer term planning, whether it's 10 years or up to 30 years out in terms of those longer term solutions. So we've uh, had our consultant team take a look at the seven mile stretch of, of the railroad from the San Diego Orange County border all the way up to the Dana Point city limits to identify any uh, what we call emergent issues that are basically popping up along that stretch, whether it's on the coastal side, the seaward side, or on the inland side. And then we bin them into kind of two categories, whether we need to monitor those sites or there are sites that rise to the occasion of us needing to have some sort of a solution immediately. Otherwise, we're going to experience, experience another closure after we reopen with the latest one. So next slide, please. Next slide. So in terms of the initial assessment, the focus really is how do we keep the railroad operational? And that's that's really the, um, the, the goals and objectives of, of this particular effort. And what we wanna do, uh, what our consulting team has done um, are basically field reconnaissance, literature review, as, as well as aerial uh, topography reviews and, and other uh, literature search searches. And they have been able to identify areas that are in need of monitoring as well as areas that are in need of reinforcement. And I'm gonna be going over those. Next slide, please. So this is a summary table of the seven areas that are in need of uh, monitoring. They don't quite rise to the occasion of needing immediate actions, but in terms of the seven uh, spot locations, they are uh, effectively not trending in the right direction as far as um, potentially leading to uh, major issues. And as you can see, under uh, monitoring area number four, that's one of the locations, if you recall, that's at milepost 204.2, where we had to re um, remove two spans of the bridge. Uh, that's already set in motion, unfortunately. So things are moving uh, very rapidly, as you can see. And then even in um, monitoring area number seven, there's been some riprap uh, loss as a result of the lack of beach that um, we've had to work with Metrolink to uh, place some riprap out there on an emergency basis. Uh, next slide, please. So the next uh, series of slides are just the specific locations. You can see here monitors area one and two. Uh, for area number one, it's in the Doheny Beach area just south of, and there's beach erosion and a similar situation where um, there are challenges over at Pochi Beach um, and, and there's a pedestrian underpass there. And by the way, the, the map to the right is the corresponding location um, uh, to these monitoring areas. Next slide, please. As for numbers uh, three, four, and five, you can, um, for number three, it's really a, um, a beach erosion that's uh, happening on the seaward side. And for number four um, and, and five, that's really the, uh, the Mariposa pedestrian bridge. That particular photo still, um, we, we had not experienced the, the landslide at that time. I believe it was taken back in roughly about the December timeframe of last year. And uh, you can see that since um, January that uh, the site conditions has changed dramatically. Uh, next slide, please. And then for numbers uh, or number six at Calafia Beach, there is sedimentation that's coming from uh, the slope area or, or the, um, the upper side of the slope. And that sedimentation has caused issues on the railroad. So, so that's an area that needs to be monitored. And then finally, number seven, this is an area that is just north of um, one of the initial uh, areas that we've had issues with, if you recall, at 206.8 uh, in an earlier slide. And this is in the Cypress Shore area. Uh, next slide, please. So here are four areas I wanna maybe spend a little more time and focus on. There are four areas that are in need of immediate action. And again, if you look at just uh, jumping on to number three, you can see that that particular situation has already been set in motion with the erosion that happened and the, the bridge span uh, removal that we've had to undertake in working with Metrolink and the city and the private property owner. 
Uh, next slide, please. So for uh, reinforcement area number one, we're seeing that there's a lack of be uh, beach on the seaward side, and it's basically affecting, potentially affecting the integrity of the railroad. And so one of the uh, immediate solutions that's needed uh, is likely going to be some sort of a riprap placement to protect and enhance the integrity of the railroad. And you can see here um, in the up in the right hand side, um, it's going to be um, riprap placement, and um, and that's going to hopefully help to stabilize the the rail uh, the, uh, the the railroad tracks. Um, next slide, please. Number two is a similar situation. You can see on the left hand photo. There is no beach, and so the only uh, protection for the railroad are really just those uh, riprap. And again, in terms of immediate actions, the placement of riprap would be uh, necessary for that purpose. Next slide, please. So here's number three, which is the inland side, and that's the Mariposa um, uh, pedestrian bridge. You can see um, on the left-hand side, the photo on the upper left-hand corner is really when um, that's before the um, the landslide that occurred in January when the bridge was still intact. But since then, that's already um, been taken down a couple of spans. So in terms of the solution, it's um, looking at a temporary catchment wall to uh, block the debris from coming down onto the railroad. And then uh, in terms of a longer term solution, we're looking at potentially a longer some sort of a longer wall uh, because we're experiencing spot um, location erosions along that entire stretch. So it's not only a 204.2, but we have had um, incidents at 204.1 and other locations um, in terms of landslides. Next slide, please. Number four, this is um, on the seaward side where there is a lack of um, riprap that protects the integrity of the railroad. And so we're looking at a potential engineer. In this case, is a little different than numbers one and two, if you recall. Those are more just riprap placement. Here is more engineer riprap placement, which basically, in essence, you have a filter fabric that's underneath that lines the, the rocks, if you will. And then the rocks are strategically placed with different sizes. It's uh, sort of a concept of a, a, a jigsaw puzzle where um, it's put together uh, and it protects the, uh, the integrity of the railroad, but in terms of the uh, protection, it, it provides a stronger protection. And uh, why we're doing this here versus the other location is because there is uh, an opportunity for us to be, be able to mobilize here, which is uh, why we're able to do an engineer riprap. The ideal situation is typically is you do want to go with that solution, but absent any sort of ability to mobilize on the beach or uh, within the area, then those are challenges that may impede uh, one's ability to do engineer riprap. So next slide, please. So in terms of the next steps for the initial assessment, we have done quite a bit of outreach in terms of sharing with a large um, array of stakeholders. We have had meetings with the cities of uh, San Clemente, County of Orange, City of Dana Point, State Parks, uh, Coastal Commission, and others, and, and we'll continue to share that information with, uh, again, a, a wide array of stakeholders to try to get input on, on this initial effort and then even on the upcoming efforts with respect to more of those what we call short-term and longer-term solutions. So at this point, obviously, we don't have any of those solutions. We wanted to listen to what the input of the state, the various stakeholders uh, have in terms of um, things that we need to look at, things that we need to be paying attention to, and what are other efforts out there that you may be aware of that we should be talking to those folks. I think that's what we want to do before we go in, uh, effectively into the drawing board and looking at what those solutions may be. And then in terms of the initial assessment, going back to it, um, one of really the linchpins uh, of the initial assessment and the four reinforcement areas uh, for us to be able to implement those, uh, those um, solutions on an immediate basis, uh, the linchpin is really the regulatory permitting 
process. It's really processes in terms of the process with the Army Corps of Engineers, as well as the Coastal Commission. So we're working with those folks to hopefully um, be able to streamline the process because we really cannot afford to have any more uh, closures. And especially uh, looking at the last several years that have been ex for an extended period for months on in many cases. And then in terms of kind of a strategic look we're talking to our um, partners over at the Metrolink um, in terms of identifying stockpiles of materials needed in the event of an emergency. So next slide, please. So in terms of study outreach, I'll hand that over to Christina. All right, next slide, please. Thank you, Dan. Um, public outreach is a major part of this two-year study and we'll have touch points throughout that I'll be sharing with you in just a moment. The first step in our outreach process is meetings such as the one we're having today, which are listening sessions. Those are occurring from February of May of this year. And then after the listening sessions, we'll go back to our project partners in the community to get feedback on the draft concepts as well as the draft plan. Next slide, please. Public engagement is really an integral part of this study. I can't, I can't stress that enough. And having our project and study partners such as yourself be a part of that process is absolutely essential to our success. So additional opportunities to provide feedback beyond the listening sessions um, and those that we're conduct conducting February through March of this year will be during the initial concept development as well as the refinement of concepts, the draft feasibility report, and we anticipate the final report being available in fall of 2025. Next slide, please. Now we're gonna move into the listening session portion of our meeting today. The purpose of these listening sessions is really to hear from you. We want to hear your feedback on what we're doing thus far, um, any suggestions and insights you may have for us, and then we'll be document documenting that feedback um, and that will help inform all of our steps in this study going forward. Next slide, please. So first and foremost, we want to hear if you have any comments relative to the specified potential reinforcement areas that Dan shared with you just a moment ago. Um, so if you have any comments on any of these, please feel free um, to raise your hand in the chat or unmute yourself if you're calling in via cell phone um, or phone. We would be happy to hear from you. And please let me know, team, if you see anyone unmute and I'm not um, able to see it. So again, please use the raise your hand button or um, follow the procedures in order to um, unmute your cell phone. Kristen, do you have any thoughts regarding um, these potential reinforcement areas or Hugo, Matthew? Hi, this is this is Kristen Thomas. I don't. It doesn't look like most of your areas are really on the base. Is that correct? That is correct. All of these areas are within the city limits uh, of the city of San Clemente. I I do have a question that's not necessarily <clears throat> just with all the erosion and everything that everybody's been experiencing. The new buzz buzzword is engineering with nature, and we've been approached by some groups to talk about engineering with nature and living shorelines. I'm wondering if you guys have considered any of that for your repairs and if yes, why or why not would you not implement them? And I'm just simply asking because I don't know anything about it. We're, we are looking at that kind of stuff right now, over. Thank you. And, and I'm happy to talk to you further uh, offline about this subject matter. So in terms of the immediate actions, we're not looking at that because those living shorelines and other nature-based solutions take time in terms of the planning, engineering, and, and permitting processes. So these are really immediate actions that we need to take. Um, but in terms of the kind of, if you will, the longer term solutions, whether it's for the short term, 10 years out or 30 years out, as I mentioned earlier, and I probably should have spent a little more time on it, um, the city of San Clemente, for instance, has undertaken what they call a nature-based uh, solutions feasibility study. That particular study is funded by the Coastal Commission. And it's really to look at what you just 
what you just talked about, what are nature-based solutions that can be implemented to try to curb or reduce or, or basically um, uh, combat a beach erosion. So for the longer term um, uh, efforts, we are looking to work with the likes of the city, the county and others to integrate those where, where we can, because recognizing that OCTA only, only owns the railroad right away, but we're not the property owner in many times to the um, to the east, if you will, or the inland side, it's either owned by the city or private property or state parks or others. And on the beach side, we're not the property owner as well. So on some of those solutions, we really need to work in concert with um, the adjacent property owners. But if there are solutions that are um, implementable within the railroad right away, we'll certainly look at that. So as you know, coming from the federal government, we do have constraints by uh, rules and regulations that the FRA, as well as the California Public Utilities Commission. So we need to also work in, uh, within those two confines. So hopefully that answers your, your question. Matthew, did you have anything um, you wanted to say? Any comments? I was just going to say, uh, no, nothing to add. I would agree with what I've seen so far. Great. Thank you. How about you, Hugo? Do you have anything to contribute? Feel free to add in the chat, too, if that's um, more convenient. And I know we have some, um, some study partners from SCAG on the line. Um, do you have anything you'd like to share? If you've unmuted yourself, we can't hear you from for some reason. If you want to just add your comments in the chat, that'd be wonderful. All right. Also, um, if there's any other conditions that you think should be assessed as a part of this study, please don't hesitate um, to share those with us. Um, we will be sharing this PowerPoint um, after the, the session today. So you'll have a copy of it if you haven't received it already. And then um, feel free to reply to that with any additional comments that you may have for that and for us. And we'll be sure to include it in the in the study record. Next slide, please. All right. Now we have a series of questions we'd like to ask the participants. Um, I'll go one by one. And again, feel, please feel free um, to unmute and contribute or put any of your comments regarding these um, in the chat. We would really appreciate it. So the first is, in what ways do you believe the resilience of the rail corridor is important to the economic strength of your business agency, um, as well as the U.S. Marine Corps and the broader logistics community? Any thoughts on that we would like to share? Christine, this is Sam at Camp Pendleton. Hi, Sam. Go ahead. Hi. So from the Marine Corps perspective, the the rail is negligible for us on a day-to-day -day basis. It is of importance in case of mobilization. And while we're happy to kind of engage with you, everything you briefed so far as far as the uh, near and uh, midterm, uh, we really don't don't have much of a stake there other than the assurance of the rail continuing to operate is is of importance in case we have to have a nation level mobilization, which is about the only time we use the rail. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Um, you said a, a nation level. So you're not utilizing the rail line on a like a regular basis it's more on a, a more of an ad hoc basis is that correct correct if we have to move units to ports um either up north or to the south we use the rail otherwise the rail is not in use I see. Uh, as a matter of routine i see so the majority of any equipment that you need to move is done via the five freeway um Yes, five fifteen depends Not on. I mean, for regular training, we're we're going we're going east to Twenty Nine Palms and places like that. Otherwise, 
units are actually using the freeways uh, and driving the vehicles. Excellent. Okay, that's very, very helpful. And I'm going to read off um, what Hugo has shared with us in the chat. Um, he has stated that um, that he dialed in, um, doesn't have anything to add on the previous comment, but no impact to daily freight operations based on what has been briefed. So thank you so much for sharing that, Hugo. That's very helpful. All right. So then the next comment is, how would rail service disruptions affect your business operations, logistics, supply chain management, employee commute, revenue? Um, I'd be interested to know, are there many for SCAG or for the U.S. Marine Corps that are utilizing um, the rail corridor for commuting? If you're aware. For the Marine Corps, I'm not aware of any uh, okay. commuters. That's helpful. Thank you. Thanks, Sam. Um, Skag, would you be able to add to the chat or unmute yourself if you have anything to add in that regard? Matthew, um, are you aware of anyone commuting, utilizing the rail corridor? Um, no, not commuting, but uh, to the first and second bullet points. So 100% of our revenue, our rail cars, uh, come down the coast via the BNSF. So, you know, to the first bullet point again, and the second, um, if this line, ha as it has been, it is disrupted, uh, myself and the BNSF, you know, receive zero rail cars. There is no other active line into San Diego. Um, so, quite the disruption as far as revenue, logistics, et cetera, when this line is uh, not in service. Very, imp very important point. Absolutely. So in a, in regards to, you mentioned rail cars, is there, what about supply chain? Is that a concern as well? No, not no. supply chain so much, uh, mainly rail cars. And another note, probably 90% uh, of our business, the rail cars that we move, um, that the BN bring to us in San Diego, we then take to uh, San Ysidro. And they go into Baja. So that's another piece at the very end of this. Uh, almost all of their products, uh, the larger quantities, come via rail, via us, via the BNSF down the coast. Excellent. Thank you, Matthew. It's very helpful. I see that um, cell phone number 6445 has their um, their hand raised. If you could add, add anything. Hi, Christine. That's uh, it's Sam's number. Um, I, I just thought of something, and admittedly, I'm not sure which way the rail cars travel, but the uh, San Onofre Nuclear Generation Station, uh, as they do the decommissioning, they have rail that that take uh, low grade, um, you know, um, debris uh, to uh, Utah. Uh, and again, I'm not sure if they travel north and then east or south and then east. Uh, but I would recommend uh, reaching out to Songs or SCE uh, as a stakeholder because they have a, a pretty long decommissioning process that involves rail cars. Okay, that's very helpful. Thank you, Sam. You're welcome. Does anyone else have something to contribute? I'm looking here. All right. Um, I, okay. Um, my, uh, let's see, SCAG question is, do you see there's an impact regarding freight? So I'll, I'll take a stab at that. Um, from what I'm understanding, there, there has been impacts um, to, to the freight operators. Um, I was hearing that in terms of the, uh, for BN in particular, it's their only really logical avenue to uh, to use to go in, anywhere in the, uh, to the north. And what, what that has led to is really a suspension of additional orders because it's really challenging uh, since there's 
the, the port of San Diego to the south. And so um, before the interruption, BN would basically go from the port of San Diego, carry the goods into via this particular uh, stretch of the railroad uh, anywhere to the north. And right now with this latest suspension uh, of railroad service since uh, January, they have had to uh, stop take, taking orders. I realize that we're still in early March, but if if the um, if the suspension were to last much longer, then I I would imagine there there would be some sort of business and economic impact to to their operation. Um, so that that's the extent of what I've heard. Um, I don't know if others on uh, on our team have heard any anything else. Hi, hey, this is Jason at OCTA. Um, so freight service was resumed as of last Thursday, and they've been going uh, through the corridor ever since. Um, but there have been intermittent suspensions due to the landslide uh, currently. Uh, I'm not sure as, as it relates to some of these uh, future strategies. Um, uh, we'll have to work with all the operators uh, within the corridor to be able to implement some of the strategies. I don't know if that's your specific question or ongoing or going future suspensions or uh, it impacts to the rail service. Thank you, Jay. That, yeah. All right. Um, the next question is, you know, how can we best communicate the progress and findings from this study to your organization and the wider logistics community? We're really trying to ensure transparency and ongoing engagement. So um, we do have a website that you'll see the um, direct link to in just a few slides and all of our materials as we make them available, including our fact sheet, um, the initial assessment is also available on our website for you to peruse, which is additional detail beyond what Dan shared with you today. Um, and we encourage you to share that with others and provide additional feedback to us. We will be having um, additional uh, listing sessions with the general public going forward and the entire database, including yourselves, will be invited to that as well. Um, if you'd like to participate in those, um, there will be a public session that will be virtual as well as an in-person session in the city of San Clemente um, in, the, in the month of April and May. So we'll be sharing that information with you as well. But if you have any other suggestions on how we can best communicate, we'd be happy to hear so. And, and also, um, anything that we haven't covered today that you'd like to share with us, we'd love to hear from you as well on that, in that regard. Um, feel free um, to put anything in the chat or raise your hand if there's anything additional that comes to mind. I don't see anyone with their hand raised. We really appreciate um, everyone that's participating today and taking time out of your busy schedule to contribute to this discussion. Um, thank you for your, okay, thank you, Jessica, for adding that in there. Um, please don't forget to, to visit our website. Um, next slide, please. Um, any other comments, questions on our approach to public engagement or any other stakeholders? I, I heard a few contributed today and we're taking notes and recording this session. So we'll be sure to reach out to those um, stakeholders and ask them to to um, partner with us and participate and share feedback. So any other ones that come to mind after our meeting today, don't hesitate to reach out to us and mention them so we can make contact. Um, we we ask that you know when we start advertising those public sessions um, later this spring, if you would be so kind as to share the dates and the information with your stakeholders, that would be very helpful for us spread the word and we'd very much appreciate that. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Um, this is the actual schedule that we have going forward. I was mentioning the two general public sessions, one um, that will be virtual on April 11th and another in person in the city of San Clemente on May 21st. We are having a elected officials round table in May on the 10th and that will be with all levels state, federal, regional um, elected officials offices will be participating in that roundtable. We want to hear from them. 
as well as the coastal and marine um, habitat community-based organizations that's occurring in March, as well as emergency responders next week. And then of course, residential groups. Those residential groups are homeowners associations, many of which have already had projects literally in their backyard um, over the course of the last several years. So we're reaching out to those homeowners associations as well. Um, everyone that has participated in listening sessions up until this point and through the end of this portion of our study are encouraged to attend any of the general public sessions. Um, we're looking for a very robust participation at those. Next slide, please. This is Dan and I's um, contact information, um, as well as that project website that I referenced. Again, on the project website is our fact sheet for the study. We are getting ready to post in the next um, week or so our frequently asked questions about the study, both of which the fact sheet and the frequently asked questions are will be available in Spanish. And then the initial assessment that Dan reviewed today, um, that document is also available on our project website. That concludes our session today. And thank you very much for joining us. Um, and please don't hesitate to reach out if you have any comments or questions um, later later today or otherwise. Thank you so much.